Hello friends. Well, thank you for supporting us. Thank you for your comments. Please feel free to comment. We always look forward to hear from you. So uh, I always go through those comments. I thank God uh, for those that have been supporting us. If you want to support this ministry, the numbers are on the screen. And then you can also visit our website. It's www.lifeispiritual.org. You can send to those numbers on the screen uh, via SendWeb. You can go to the description down below and uh, you'll be able to find information about us. So I'm continuing with my testimony because the Bible says we overcame Satan by the blood of the Lamb and the word of our testimony. I hope you have learned something from the previous uh, testimony. So today I'm continuing with, you know, how the enemy tormented me and how God eventually delivered me. It doesn't matter how far you've gone. I just want to encourage you. There is hope. I don't care how many times you've aborted. I don't care how many people you have misled. I don't care. It doesn't matter how many people you have infected with HIV. It doesn't matter how many people you have killed in sacrifices or covenants or whatever you have done. God is capable of restoring you and transforming your life and using you to the glory of his name. So uh, after prayers, I would feel like uh, my powers have left me. When I was eight and the pastor prayed for me, I felt like powers had left me. So I had to get my powers back. And the only way for me to get my powers back was by causing an accident. And uh, how I would cause an accident, the first time I caused my accident, an accident, I was with my mom and my dad and my little brother. We were walking across, we were walking beside the road on the passenger's path. So uh, while I was there, it was, there is a, a highway just uh, opposite the church. So while we were walking on the side of the road, uh, I felt I was not talking to anyone from the time the pastor prayed for me. I was not talking to my mom. I was not talking to my dad. I was not talking to my brother. I was just crying because of what the pastor had done to me. He had disorganized my powers. So I wanted to get, to get more power, to be able to survive. Because in the kingdom of darkness, it is survival for the fittest. The one who has power is the one who, who rules. If you don't have power, anything can happen to you. The devil does not protect his own. So as we are walking on the side of the road, there was this car that was coming at a very high speed. The driver was driving at about uh, 80 kilometers per hour because it is a, it is a free road. And while uh, the, the driver was coming at that high speed, I decided to, to bust the front wheel I astro projected, and when I astro projected, I pierced the front wheel and the vehicle overturned. And when the vehicle overturned, uh, it overturned like about six times. Everyone was running away and, and mommy was running away. My dad, they never wanted the vehicle to fall on them because it was, it was next to where we were. But I stood very, you know, stiff. Everyone is running, but me, I was not running. And my parents thought that maybe I was traumatized. I was very scared, but I was not scared. I was astro projecting. And you see, when you astro project, you travel very quickly and come back to the body quickly because if anyone moves you before you come back to your body, you can drop down and die. So it, it, it required a lot of concentration. I, I used to concentrate for you to be able to get out of your body at that speed, cause an accident and come back, you have to be at a high level of sorcery. So by eight, I was more powerful than my grandmother because every generation has to be greater than the, the previous generation. So now, uh, the vehicle just stopped right ahead of, right in front of me. That is when it stopped overturning. And the, the driver got out, he was not hurt because he had a, a seat belt and uh, 
the lady, the passenger broke her arm and there was so much blood. So I was now concentrating on the blood while coming back to my body to be empowered because the, the demons, they feed on the life force. They don't, they don't necessarily have to drink the blood. They, what they are interested in is the life force of the, the blood of the person that they are stealing from. Because the, the, the life of flesh is in the blood. And for Jesus to give us life, he had to shed his own blood. So it's during that time, after the vehicle had stopped overturning, my mom came and she held me just after I had entered into my body. And it's like, what's wrong with you? And I woke up like I was coming from a very deep sleep. And I was like, mommy, mommy. And then she hugged me and I told her, mommy, I'm very scared. She said, no, you don't have to. And I, I became more powerful. So we went, we had to board another car and now go to town. And when we went to town, I caused another accident. And then we, we were passing through the hospital to get to our home. And everywhere I was passing, people were dying in the wards. So... I thank God he delivered me. No one could set a person like me free. So I, I don't care about people's opinions. I care about the God that delivered me. I know people are judgmental, but as I told you in the beginning, I did not initiate myself. I did not call the devil to come into my life. I was initiated against my will. So there's nothing that I did intentionally. It was, it was the enemy who stole my body and he was using my body against my will. So I, I began now to, to serve the enemy. I knew that I was powerful like my grandmother and I was stronger than my grandmother. Uh, people now began to consult me more than my grandmother and my grandmother became jealous. Imagine, in the kingdom of darkness, there is no relative. So my grandmother began to plan on how to kill me because I became more powerful than her and I was taking her customers. I was, uh, people were more scared of me than my grandmother. So I became more powerful and I became a threat. So I began now to fall sick all the time. I was always fainting, I was always sickly. But uh, the things that I was doing were beyond my age, you know, uh, causing division in families. Like uh, there is a, a certain family that uh, the, the wife and the husband were all committed in ministry and the devil sent me on a mission to divide this family because the woman was barren and uh, we sent a devil's agent and a man ended up sleeping with this girl and that was the end of that marriage. He slept with other women, he had children outside the marriage, and yeah, the couple split and the ministry was also disorganized. Uh, I would go to church every Sunday because it was a must in our family. My parents were, were Christians and we had to go to church as a family. So what I would do, I would leave the spirits behind, sometimes in the bathroom, the demons that I was working with. I would leave them in the bathroom. Sometimes I would leave them in the church compound. And I would carry a few demons that could, I could be able to sit with comfortably in the church. And when I, when, whenever it was Sunday, I would first cause my parents to be so annoyed, so upset. I would tell them I want to go with a certain dress and they look for the dress, it's nowhere to be found. So they are upset. Then uh, after they find the dress, it is very late. Remember, they are ministers. So I would make them to go to church very, very late. They are upset, they are embarrassed. You know, I'm, they are supposed to be at church early. They are supposed to set an example for the other members, but they are always late. So the church knows them as late comers. And, um, and then I, I would dress indecently. My dresses were short and I would put on high heels. So I come to church indecently and uh, I'm wearing heels and I have to walk from the back door to the front door in the middle of the service to attract people's attention. 
my hair was always disorganized, like in a way that I would plate, um, I, I had dreadlocks, but different colors, not the normal dreadlocks. And I was not supposed to cut off my hair because it had been covenanted to the devils. So I had powers in my hair, uh, my real hair. Uh, I also was not supposed to cut off my fingernails because I had powers in my fingernails and they could not break. I had very long nails and they were not this normal color, they were orange. So my nails were natural, they were not cut and my fingernails and they were very long and I would never do I would never do any housework because when the soul is working and the body, the body is always very, very, very weak. So I would enter church and cross leg, disorganize these people. When the pastor says, let us open our Bibles, that is when I'm asking my neighbor to tell the other neighbor to lend me a pen. And, and that is when uh, I'm doing things that are disorganizing the area that I'm in, I would send sleep. Someone comes to church on Sunday, in the morning service a person is dozing, I would send sleep. And then for the women, I would make them to move up and down in church because the demons I had left in the bathroom would be calling them all the time, summoning them to go and, and uh, see how they are looking all the time. You see, you've gone to church to pray, but you're all the time in the mirror trying to see how beautiful you are, how smart you are. Today, I'm, I'm so smart, I'm smarter than so and so, you see. And then in the choir, my mother wanted me to join choir. Hey, what I did to the choir members, forgive me. <laughs> I would... I would cause the choir members not to, not to sing to God, not to minister unto God in truth and in spirit. I made them to minister in flesh. Who, who has a better voice? Who can sing better than the other? Uh, and then they were all lasting for the choir leader because he was a young, handsome man who was also gifted. He had voices. So I would put a spell on these ladies and they begin to fight, compete for this choir leader. And as a, as a result, there was so much coupling in the choir. Everyone was a boyfriend or girlfriend of someone in the choir. And they were singing beautifully, but they were singing in the flesh. So uh, it, it would not attract the presence of God to come down in church. And the pastors would struggle when they are ministering. And when the pastor is in the spirit, he's ministering and it's time to give offering. I would send a demon to enter a person and the person would stretch his hand to steal from the offerings. And now that would disorganize the entire service. The person is arrested and now taken out. And you see, things like that. I was always causing chaos in church. And uh, when it's time to pray for people and the pastor was making an altar call, I would walk and go in front and then uh, I would be in the fifth uh, line because the church was big. Uh, I was fellowshipping at Ginger Miracle Center. And I love my pastor, Pastor Robert Kawa. I love you so much. And uh, yeah, the wife went to be with the Lord, Grace Kawa. I, 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 it's so sad, but I love my pastor so much. So. Uh, I went to, <laughs> sorry about that, it's so emotional. So uh, I would go to the fifth row uh, in the church and when the pastor is praying, I would collect these demons that they are casting out because remember, I was, I was, uh, our bodies are temples. They can, they can, they can inhabit God. We can have God in our bodies. So if God is not in your body, it means you can also contain demons in your bodies. You can have as many demons as possible. Your body is so big. It's even, it may not be big in size compared to a pig, but the kind of things that your body can inhabit, a, an animal cannot. An animal, like you see the man who had demons, he had legion in the book of Luke. He had demons that were controlling the entire place. When those demons were cast into the pigs, the pigs could not handle the amount of demons that the man had, one man. 
So they had to go and commit suicide. What am I trying to say is that uh, one man like this can have demons that are controlling an entire region, an entire area. One man can be turned into a principality. And a, a man like this, an individual can also can also inhabit God. You can have God in your body and you can be a small manifestation of God in this world. You can be speaking and things fall into, into place. You can be, you know, uh, you can be exposing the secrets in the, in the kingdom of darkness. One man like this can be destroying uh, territorial demons because of the God that is in your life. So you either have God in your life or demons in your life. But if you have God in your life, you're on a safer side. You're actually very safe with God in your life. So I would gather these demons and then look for someone that is vulnerable and that person is in ministry. Let's say an usher. If pastor is delivering people, praying for people and they are getting delivered, I would gather the, the few demons that he has cast out and then look for an usher that is stealing things from the church. You're stealing the money from the offerings. They send you to buy something. You, 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 you don't, you're not so honest with the pastor. You, you, tell, you overprice the pastor. So those are the people I would look for in the church. And I would send the demons to those people. Now, if, you're, if an usher is down and is possessed, the pastor will obviously run to rescue his usher or one of his members, you know. So while he's casting out, he'll be casting out the same demons that he has been casting out. By the time he now remembers to come to the congregation, he's tired. So he will just say a general prayer and people will go back home without being ministered to. So, uh, and then after, I would sit in the service with a few demons. Now, it's, when it's time to, for, for people to be prayed for, I would go and collect the other demons. And then I come to, to, to the altar very fully charged, you know, to send pollution in the atmosphere. When pastor is praying for someone, I would cause that person to smell and the pastor would immediately leave that person and go to another person. So things like that. Uh, so I lived like that until when I was 11. Now when I was 11, again, I went deeper into the things of Satan. I, was, uh, I visited my auntie who, who connected me to very popular secular artists in the country. I used to think that Music was just about talent until the day I met with Lucifer. So my auntie introduced me to this secular artist, the celebrities during holidays when I visited her. And I thought that was, you know, it was cool to be known by celebrities, just like each and every one of you who is watching. Some of you, when you see a celebrity, you want to take a selfie and things like that. So as a youth, I felt my auntie was cool because my parents were very strict. Don't watch, don't watch uh, secular stations. Don't listen to secular music. Don't go there. Don't go here. They were full of don'ts. And my auntie was a very free person and she was financially okay compared to my parents. So when I visited her and she began to take me to these parties, I began now to uh, interact with different kinds of people. I began to, uh, I got exposed to a different kind of lifestyle. Uh, like I got exposed to alcohol, I got exposed to, you know, cigarettes, I got exposed to, to parties, secular parties. I got exposed to dressing indecently. I got exposed, you know, to the, to the life, the worldly lifestyle. So uh, when I came back home, I was very rebellious. In that, in one party, I met with a, a very popular secular artist. He's a brother to, and their family, in their family, they are all musicians. And his name is Wizard. He, he shortens the name, but if, you, if you're following the music in, in Uganda, you will know he's Wizard. 
So when I met with this uh, musician, I felt like it was an opportunity because I, I really loved to sing and, and you know, meeting my celebrity, I had begun to watch secular music and I had begun to listen to the brother's songs because he had become so popular in the country. So now it is after that encounter that my life changed from bad to worse. I began now to, I began to, I, my, my, the kinds of friends I made in school changed. I got friends who were rebellious, they were not concentrating in class, all the time they were writing songs, they were gossiping about celebrities, they, they wanted to know which celebrity is doing what, which other celebrity is doing what, until when I met with, uh, until one day, we were going to do our mock exams. There is this uh, concert that was going to take place in Jinja. There is a musician, a certain musician, he's very popular in our country. Um, he was going to launch his album, his music album. He had just survived an accident in Tanzania. This musician is a devil worshiper and uh, he, he he initiates very many people's children. He, in newspapers in Uganda, he has, uh, the journalists have released stories of him burning someone to death. Journalists have released story, stories of him, you know, uh, getting involved in, in criminal uh, cases. But you see, the government has never come out to do anything about it because he's, he's controlling his, and he's working for certain people. So uh, now, this musician was going to launch his album, his music album. And before they launch, they move around advertising. So uh, I was attracted with my little brother to run after his car when he was advertising his concert. People were following him. He was out of the open roof vehicle and people were following him and his brother to the venue. So we ran with my little brother and against my parents' will, we ran, we disobeyed and we followed the car. And uh, while we were at the venue, this musician sang one of his songs and then he sat in the open roof, the brother came out. And because I had gone to see my celebrity, I pulled through the crowd, I went and peeped through the, through the vehicle. And when I, when I peeped, what I saw, this musician's eyes had turned from the normal eyes to, to uh, I don't know how I can explain, but if, if you have ever seen a cat, the, the eyes of a cat in the night, they were, they were shining somehow with, they had changed, they were, they were like reptilian eyes. Let me say they were like reptilian eyes. And, uh, and uh, I saw myself in the car, yet I was outside. Now my soul, I remember I told you, my grandmother opened up my life up to the spiritual world. So I would travel in and out of my body. This time when I saw this musician, my soul got out of my body and he caged my soul in a glass. And that was the end of me. My physical body was just like a puppet. Everything I was doing physically was being commanded in, by the kingdom of darkness. There are people that have sold their souls to the devil, but there are people whose souls have been caged by the devil. So my soul was caged by the devil. And uh, the, the brother moved out of the car and attracted people to run after him. And we drove, I'm going to talk about my soul and I'll talk about my body so that you understand what I'm talking about. So we branched with my, when he's holding my soul, we branched from that venue and we went through the go, uh, through Bell Avenue, those of you who know in Jinja, Bell Avenue. And then we went to the golf course and through the golf course before they fenced it, we, uh, we went to the source of the Nile and we went, we entered a boat. These people, uh, people who go to the, to the kingdom of darkness for, for, for power, 
for success, for fame are real. They really go there. So we went into this boat and we sailed. We went to a certain island where this musician gets his powers from. And when we went to this island, he performed certain rituals. He spoke certain words and he dropped eggs and the boat we were in began to sink. And then when this boat began to sink, I was crying, I was screaming, Daddy, Mommy, come and help me. And no one was there to help me. And uh, we, when the boat was sinking, a fish, a very big fish came. It can swallow about 15 people. It came and uh, this musician and the people that were in the boat, they all, people that were in the boat were very much aware of what is happening. Some of them were businessmen, some of them were politicians, others were celebrities. And they go to the kingdom of darkness for power. So now we were entering into the fish with all those people apart from the guy who was sailing the boat. So we entered into the fish, it swallowed us. I was very scared. Inside the belly of a fish, it's like you're entering a, a coffin. It's like, it, it, it's very disgusting because it smells, it's very dark, it's, it's a horrible place for anyone to be in. And someone can ask, how can you enter the fish, the belly of a fish and remain alive? Jonah entered a similar kind of fish. And he was there for three days and it spat him in Nineveh and he preached the gospel. So I entered a similar kind of fish. Life is spiritual. There are people who enter and travel through fish and they go to the marine kingdom. I entered that fish. I fainted. I came back to life. I fainted. The spiritual realm is very quick. It is faster than the physical realm. We traveled and we entered. When I came back to my consciousness, the we had arrived and the and the fish was now spitting us, I found myself at the entrance of a certain, uh, I found myself at the entrance of a cave. And this cave had about seven gates. And now that is a place called hell. That is a pit. I was entering the pit of hell. And when I, and when I arrived, there are demons that were opening these gates. These demons that were opening these gates, they were, they were also, just like I was so surprised to see demons, and you know, it was my first time to see a demon. Just like I was so surprised to see demons, they were also surprised to see a human being. They would come touch your skin to see, you know, uh, they are like primitive beings. So, even me, I was scared. When they were coming closer to me, I would be screaming. I would be crying for, for help. Someone can ask me to uh, describe to them how these demons looked like. Now, these demons are very skinny. They are like uh, tiny reptiles that, have, that walk on their two legs and, and they have two hands. And their eyes are sunk deep. They, are, they, they have those eyes that are, they are sunk, they are like, of course, the reptilian kind of eyes. And their teeth are very sharp, like dog teeth. And these, these demons, the, the color is a color of a gecko, or that color, that pale, ca palish color of a reptile. That is how they were looking like. And some of them had tails, some of them did not have tails. And... They were, they were looking at me for the first time and, you know, they were like, it's like the introduction was so weird. I was scared. I wanted to go back and they were dragging me in. I was, I, I found, when I woke up, I found they had chained me. They had put chains on my hands and on my legs. And now I was entering hell. Now, hell, I would be describing hell for you because it is another topic. I'll be describing hell for you. But let me go to what I saw. I stayed in hell for, for many years. And uh, I, I can be able to describe to you hell from the beginning of hell to the end of hell, where the lake of fire is and where the throne of Satan is and how it is built and who Satan is and 
because I met with Lucifer now. That was the first time I met with Lucifer. So I arrived in a hall, a very, very big hall with a very red cap, uh, with a very long red carpet. Uh, and this carpet, it, it, it comes from the throne of Saturn. It comes from, from the throne of Saturn and it is built with a mouth and fang of a serpent that goes down and it spreads like a carpet to where we were from the, from the gate of hell. The Bible says, I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. There are gates, gates of hell. Hell has gates. So, walking on that carpet is a carpet of deception. It's a world of deception. You know, the Bible, the Bible says, Satan is a father of liars. Jesus said, you belong to your father, the devil. When he speaks lies, that is his language. Satan speaks lies. So, we entered... We entered, uh, as soon as I found myself on that red carpet, I saw Lucifer sitting on his throne. In the next video, I'll be explaining to you how Lucifer's throne is built, how hell looks like and everything. But I found Lucifer on his throne and this is how he looks like. Satan is a fallen angel. Lucifer was his name because Lucifer means light bearer. He was a light bearer before he fell from the kingdom of darkness. Light symbolizes wisdom. He was very brilliant. He was very wise. He was created with all the precious stones, silver, gold, diamond. You see a musician singing that you shine bright like a diamond. You're beautiful like a diamond is in the sky. This musician is worshiping the devil. You're the beautiful star I see. He was, a, he was a star. He was a morning star. He was beautiful. This musician, there are musicians who have sold their souls to the devil and they're worshiping the devil. So uh, he was created with all precious stones and the musical instruments, the drum, the keyboard, the guitar, the trumpets, every musical instrument that you know and some musical instruments that you have never seen were created and built in Lucifer. He was perfect until the day iniquity was found in him. He was perfect. You know, God is, God is perfect. He created Satan with beauty that I cannot explain. He's one of the most beautiful angels that God has ever created. He did not need anyone to do makeup on him. He didn't need anyone. You see, when you're going to shoot a video or an artist is going to shoot a video, they have to put some makeup on you. Lucifer was created with that beauty that can change according to what he's dressed in. Let's say if he's singing hip hop, he will look like a hip hop artist. He doesn't need anyone to design him. If he's doing R&B, he will be like an R&B artist. If he's singing, he doesn't need anyone to back him up. He can sing all voices at the same time, tenor, soprano, alto, bass, and all the angelic and human voices. He can combine all of them. He can, he can draw strings from within him. And, and move into dimensions of music that a normal person has never entered in. Have you ever heard someone singing and then you feel like your body is getting some, goose, some, some reactions? Lucifer would sing better than that. He would sing and everything would stop just to worship God and to listen to him. Now that was before he fell. And now he's in a fallen state. But... The, 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 when God gives you a gift, he does not take it away from you. It is up to you to decide how you use that gift. You either use it to serve God or to serve the devil. But at the end of the day, we are all accountable to God for what we use our gifts for. So Satan chose to use his gift the wrong way. When you talk about politics, he is, he is a politician. He knows the language of politics because he was there before man. He was involved in politics in heaven and he managed to win a third of the angels and they fell. He managed to convince 
man against, against God, the first man, Adam. So when you talk about politics, Satan knows that language. He knows, he knows music. He's actually music itself. You cannot bring any artist in this world and compare that artist to Lucifer. Even the angels, they know that Lucifer was created in that area of music. So now, what makes his music irrelevant is before his music was a means of transport. He, he used to transport the presence of God to all the creations that God has created. Because when you worship him in truth and in spirit, his, his presence comes down and he begins to minister unto his people. So now, Lucifer was that means of transport. Imagine the kind of, of rank that Lucifer had. He's both cherubim and a seraphim. He used to walk on stones of fire. Lucifer, he had, he had power that, you know, all the other angels did not have. And he felt proud. He felt like he could take the, pre he could take the place of the one who created him. Because uh, out of all the angels, he was one of the few angels that had stones built in, in him. God, God has everything in him, but Lucifer had all these stones in him and he had all the beauty, he had all the gift, he had all the influence and he felt like he could outsmart God. He felt like he could go and ascend and take over the position of God and be worshipped. He has always desired to be worshipped from the beginning and he still desires to be worshipped up to today. His ambitions have never changed. That's why you've heard of devil worshippers. Now, devil worshippers, Illuminati, and all that, I'll be describing to you what all this is about because some people don't differentiate. They don't know what Illuminati is. They don't know what devil worshippers are. They don't know what Satanism is. They don't know what sorcery is. They don't know what witchcraft is. But in these videos, as you follow my testimony, I'll be breaking it down for you so that you understand how the kingdom of darkness is built so that when you go to pray you go to pray with with knowledge with understanding of who your enemy is and you see the bible says my people perish due to lack of knowledge but you will know the truth and the truth shall set you free if you want to know more of the things that i'm talking about you can go to Amazon Kindle or to our website www.lifeisspiritual.org and you can be able to get our books. I have Erica Part 1, Seven Years in Hell, Erica Part 2, 18 Years with Lucifer, Erica Part 3, Witchcraft and Spiritual Warfare, Erica Part 4, Death, Hell and Heaven and the truth about money. All these books are available on our website, www.lifeisspiritual.org. In Uganda, our books are available at Uganda Bookshop, Aristoc Bookshop, Enjoy Bookshop. And uh, in Kenya, you can contact us on the numbers on the screen. When I met with, uh, when I met with uh, now Lucifer, he began now to speak to me. And as I continue with my testimony, I'll be telling you the conversations yeah, that I had with him. And he began to laugh at me. I was crying. I was seeing now fallen angels. There were certain girls that had been enslaved. They, were, they had been yoked. He had put things in, in their necks and they were lining up. There were seven virgin girls that this musician had sacrificed to Lucifer for power. And uh, he went and hand shook with the devil and the, the enemy was thanking him for delivering me to hell. And Satan told me, young girl, I am the prince of this place. Not even your government, not even your father or your mother. Let me try to speak in the voice that he was using. Young girl, I am the prince of this place. Not even the government, not even your mother, not even your father 
can deliver you from my hand. I am the one that influences politics. I influence the, financi the financial system of that world. That world is governed and run by my children. It is run by me, so no one can deliver you from my hand. He didn't know that Zechariah 9.11 had provided a solution for me. Today, I am delivered. I will be continuing with my testimony. I want to give an opportunity to a person that has not given his life to Christ. Zechariah 9.11, by the blood of his covenant, I will set your captives free from the pit wherein there is no water. I will tell you in the, next in the next video, I will tell you what happened to me, what happened when we met with Satan, the conversations that we had with him, and how I got my deliverance. I got delivered on 21st February 2009 by the mighty hand of God. Our God is so powerful. Our God is so mighty. I want to encourage you. It doesn't matter what you're going through. Hold on to God. My husband will come to share with you the word, explain everything that I have been talking about and align it with the word of God so that someone out there can be helped. Today we are doing it differently and this is how we have been led to do it. We are still serving God together and together we shall continue to expose the kingdom of darkness. So I want to lead you to Christ right now. Say, Lord Jesus, I accept you into my life as my personal Lord and Savior. I denounce Satan. I denounce the kingdom of darkness. I am a child of God. I serve Jesus. Jesus is my personal Lord and Savior. He gave up his life for me. He died and he rose again. In Jesus' name, amen. Let me tell you, that is the best decision you have ever made in life. Serve your God. Love Jesus. Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. May God richly bless you. Feel encouraged to share, like, comment, sit with your family. I know you will pick something, one or two, from everything that I'm sharing. Life is spiritual. If you want to donate to our ministry, the numbers are on the screen and in the description below. Avoid people who try to contact you in the comment section. And you can visit our website, www.lifeispiritual.org. I love you. Bye. And welcome back. We thank the Lord for all of this knowledge and information that he's giving out to this generation. We thank God for the revelation and for the eyewitness testimony that God has given us in this generation so as to empower his people, so as to inform this generation so that we don't fall by the wayside, so that we are not lost. Jesus came to seek and to save that which was lost. In Erica's testimony, we hear about the same devil we read about in the Bible, the same enemy which stole authority and took authority from Adam as a result of Adam's fall, as a result of Adam not knowing the law, the unspoken law that whoever you yield yourself as servant to obey, you become the slave of whomever you obey. And Adam didn't know that. And even if he did, he still sinned and transferred all of the authority and the power that God had given to him over to a fallen cherub called Lucifer, who is now called Satan, which means adversary. That name Lucifer means the light bearer. And it means more than just the bearer of light as in because his body would illuminate and shine with a brilliance that would illuminate the heavens, but he also carried the light, meaning the knowledge of God. And cherubs have a lot more knowledge of God than the ordinary angels, and they seem to have more knowledge of God than the seraphim. And there are hierarchies even in heaven. 
they are the archangels or the cherubim, and then they are the seraphim, and then they are the, the angels. And those are the, just, the, just the ones we read about, and just the ones we are interacting with. There may be more beings and other creations which God has made which we know nothing about, but we will not dwell on those. What we see from the scriptures is that Adam fell, and that the serpent was subtle, and that the serpent approached Eve in such a way that it was possible to deceive her. It took time. I don't believe it was just one conversation where the serpent approached Eve and said, Yea, has God said that you shall not touch any of the fruit of the garden? I think this was a very subtle approach. And every day he would come back with different questions. And he created a relationship with Eve whereby Eve appeared to be always educating him and informing him. And he would come asking new questions and informing her of things that she might not have known about uh, God's creation. But one thing is certain, this Lucifer was very well versed in the laws of God. He understood the laws of heaven because the laws of God predate the writings of Moses. They were always there. It was by law that Adam fell. Adam violated the law of obedience and he fell and lost his dominion. And when he lost his dominion, Satan now had the authority over the, the power of the air. He had authority now over the fish of the, of the sea and over every living thing that moves upon the earth because those, that is the authority and the dominion that God had given to Adam. But before we get into in these things too deeply, let's start with a word of prayer and then we can explore the scriptures a bit more. Wonderful Father, I thank you for everything that Erica has shared. I thank you, Lord, that these things are not shared to create fear or to make people afraid or to give people a sense of inadequacy, but rather to inform and to equip and to encourage and inspire so that they may know that greater is he that is in us than he that is in the world that every soul under the sound of my voice may know that indeed there is a devil, there is a hell, but there is also a God in heaven and that Jesus is real and that all power has been given unto the Lord Jesus. Flow through this vessel, Lord, and touch and deliver and encourage and heal and sanctify everyone under the sound of my voice, Lord, I thank you that you are able to do so simultaneously all over the world at once. We honor you, Lord, and yield ourselves to you. I apply the blood of Jesus upon every last soul, spirit, soul, and body under the sound of my voice in Yeshua's name. Amen. Amen. So what we see in Erica's testimony is just an extension of the story we've been told in the book of Genesis, how Adam fell how the serpent approached Eve and began to ask her questions to inspire or to create a conversation, a rapport, so that they can be going back and forth. But God's commandment to Eve was, and to Adam was one, and what Satan suggested was a complete different thing. I want you to look at the, the, the strategy that Satan had. Genesis chapter three from verse one. Now the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field, which the Lord God had made. And he said unto the woman, Yea, hath God said, Ye shall not eat of every tree of the garden? You see how subtle he is. Ah, just, just catch this for a moment. You see, it's any, anything, anyone that is subtle comes incrementally, meaning that he starts with a very small, in a very small way, and then begins to increase ever so slightly over time. So this conversation that the serpent had with Eve was not something that was instantaneous. It, he didn't just show up and start asking questions. No, he built a, rep a rapport with Eve. You know, they had been talking for quite some time. And the mistake that Adam made was that he would allow Eve to walk and wander off by herself, unsupervised. But um, the, 
serpent was able to build a relationship with Eve slowly and continuously over time. And then it resulted in this conversation that we're seeing here. Has God said, ye shall not eat of every tree of the garden? Now look, at, look closely at his words, because God did not say that you shall not eat of every tree. And Satan knew that God had not said, ye shall not eat of every tree. Satan knew that God had said, you shall not eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. But why is he asking Eve if God has said that they shall not eat of every tree? Because he wanted Eve to correct him so that he can appear to be the ignorant one and she can appear to be the one who is teaching or the one who is correcting. And in verse two, he says, and the woman said unto the serpent, we may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God has said, ye shall not eat of it, neither shall ye touch it, lest ye die. Now, that was even an addition which Eve had added, because the Lord God had said, neither shall ye touch it. He simply said, ye shall not eat of it, lest ye die. Verse 16 of the second chapter of Genesis. And the Lord God commanded the man saying, of every tree of the garden you may freely eat, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat of it, for in the day that you eat thereof you shall surely die. Okay, so God had already instructed and given clear instructions saying, you shall not eat of this tree. But why is Eve adding an, an extra commandment saying, God, is, God has said that you shall no, not only just, you shall not just partake of it, you shall not touch it, lest ye die. The Lord God did not say that. He simply said, you shall not eat of it. But in verse three, she says, but of the fruit of the tree, which is in the midst of the garden, God has said, ye shall not eat of it, neither shall ye touch it lest ye die, which is not what God said. God simply said, ye shall not eat of it. So that showed that in some way, there was some anger or some indignation that Eve felt about this tree, about the commandment which God had given. And Satan sensed that. And then he began to speak. And in the fourth verse, he says, and the serpent said unto the woman, you shall not surely die. For God does know that in the day you eat thereof, then your eyes shall be opened and you shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. And when the woman saw that the tree was good for food and that it was pleasant to the eyes and a tree to be desired to make one wise, she took of the fruit thereof and did eat and gave also unto her husband with her and he did eat. And the eyes of them both were opened and they knew that they were naked and they sewed the fig leaves together and made themselves aprons. You see what happened? The tree of the knowledge of good and evil. I've already explained this, the tree of a certain kind of philosophy. It's not that her eyes were opened as soon as she partook of this fruit. What happened was this, you see the devil is a liar. Her eyes were actually closed. Because if we look at our human condition today, we cannot see spirits. But at that time, there was a time where human beings could see spirits. You could see both in the physical world and you could see into the spiritual world. But now we are unable to see into the spiritual world. So our, were our eyes opened or were our eyes closed? Our eyes were closed at that moment. So, furthermore, when Adam sinned, he gave all of the dominion which God had given to man over to Satan. Adam was the God of this world before he sinned. But when he sinned, he passed over all of that power to Satan. Now you need to understand what the implication is because Adam had the power over the constellations. He had power over the sun, over the moon, over the stars. He had authority over all of the, all, all of the watchers who had been assigned to various positions in the galaxies, in the universe, throughout the universe, there are various angels whom God has assigned to various specific positions to manage certain positions, to, to, to continue the, 
the balance, the delicate balance, which is of nature. There should be only a certain amount of wind. There should be a certain amount of rain. So there should be, all of this must be managed regularly. And so there are specific angels that manage all of these things. And Adam was in charge. But now when Adam sinned, he gave that crown to Satan. And now Satan was now in, in charge and had authority and dominion and rulership over the very constellations and the very things that God had given Adam authority over. Those things were now transferred over to Satan. And now Satan had authority over the sun, over the moon, over the constellations, over the stars, over everything, over the entire earth. God, remember, he gave Adam dominion. He said in, in Genesis chapter 1 verse 28, And God blessed them, and God said unto them, Be fruitful, multiply, replenish the earth, and subdue it and have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the fowl of the air, and over every living thing that moves upon the earth. Now the word there, subdue, implies that there are things that are wild, that need to be brought under control. So God had commanded Adam and blessed Adam and told him to be fruitful, to multiply, to replenish the earth, and to bring everything that is godless under the control of God. So God had assigned Adam to tame the earth. He had assigned Adam to bring the earth under the control of heaven and to impose the government of heaven upon the earth. So Satan devised a method to stop that because Satan had made the earth his domain. So I'm, I'm telling you all of this because this flows into what happened with Erica and Satan's mandate to bring upon the earth that which is in hell. Because his mandate is to do the opposite of what Jesus prayed in the Lord's Prayer. Jesus said, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Well, Satan's plan is the direct opposite. He wants to bring his own kingdom come and he wants his own will to be done on earth as it is in the kingdom of darkness, on earth as it is in hell. So, God's plan was to duplicate heaven on earth using the human being. Now, a human being is a vessel. A human being is a very unique creature because he has his own will, he has his own mind, he has his own emotions, however, he is also a container for spirits. And Erica mentioned the Gadarene man. He was of the tribe of Gad. When Jesus was crossing over the river Jordan, he was crossing over with the disciples and there was a, a wind and a tempest and, the, and, and they almost capsized. They almost, uh, uh, you know, it almost sunk the ship and Jesus came out he was asleep underneath and he came out and said, peace be still and everything settled down. Well. All of these winds and all of these, uh, you know, all of this crazy chaos was being caused by spirits who were dwelling in that Gadarene. And that Gadarene was a house for thousands of spirits. And when Jesus asked him, what is your name? He said, Legion, for we are many. So there were thousands of demons inside of this human being. So one human being can carry thousands of spirits. And one human being can carry the spirit of God. And yet it is, we know that concerning God, God cannot be contained in creation, but a human being can carry the spirit of God. So then how massive is a human being spiritually? How, how huge is a human being? So we see that what man lost in the garden when he sinned, we're just scratching the surface of it. We're just, we're really just scratching the surface of this thing because what he lost was authority and power. And now everything that God created could now be turned against humanity. And this is exactly what Satan did because humanity has the mandate to bring upon earth that which is in heaven. As a vessel, a man should be full of the spirit of God so that that which exists in heaven can be reflected on the earth. But now, if the man has fallen and does not have God in him, then spirit, other spirits will come inside of him. And then that man will begin to reflect whatever is in hell will now 
come on the earth. And this is why you see the situation of hell on earth, because man is a container and he will either carry the spirit of God or he will carry the spirits of demons. But either way, he'll carry something. So, you see Erica's situation. She was initiated as a child by her grandmother who was already initiated even as in her own childhood. You see, this thing is generational. And we see that, that these, uh, these things are generational when we look at Exodus chapter 20. God gave a very specific command. In Exodus chapter 20 from verse 3, You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make unto thee any graven image or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that is in the earth beneath or that is in the water under the earth. And when you go into many Christians' houses, you'll see a picture of a Jesus there or you'll see a picture of angels. And yet God has commanded you, you'll not make any graven image or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that is in the earth beneath or that is in the water under the earth. So those images that you have on the wall, that you have, you think that, you know, it brings you closer to God. No, that which brings you closer to God is keeping his commandments. That's what brings you close. All right. So in the earth beneath or that is in the water under the earth, you shall not bow down yourself to them nor serve them. For I, the Lord, your God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children unto the third and fourth generation of them that hate me. So you see, when an ancestor indulges in any kind of witchcraft, sorcery he goes to a shrine he goes to a witch seeking assistance seeking powers maybe they they were barren and now they're seeking uh children maybe for one reason or another they are seeking assistance i want you to know that the curse not only affects them but three and four generations after them this curse will go through the generations destroying and introducing curses that were entered into by an ancestor who you don't even know Okay, so this is an, and this is affecting people's lives today. Today, people are suffering in poverty, lack, hunger, thirst, sickness, disease, rejection, all manner of hardship and, and oppression. Why? They might have been, they might have been a, a generation after generation of very deep witches and sorcerers for, for hundreds of years, perhaps. So it is important that you understand that a human being is a container and a human being is a gate. A human being is like an altar and an altar is a portal, a point where the physical world and the spiritual world come into contact. It's a junction, okay? So in every church, you'll see an altar at the front. That is the place where the physical world and the spiritual world come into contact. All right. So life revolves around altars and covenants. Okay. So whenever the spiritual world wants to find expression in the physical world, there must be two things. There must be an altar and there must be a covenant. If there's no altar and there's no covenant, then the, the spiritual world cannot find expression or it cannot penetrate into the physical world. I told you the altar is the gateway, okay? So, it is very important to understand that even you can be an altar, depending on the spirits that you have chosen to yield yourself to. So, Genesis chapter 1 verse 28, God blessed them and God said unto them, Be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth and subdue it and have dominion. So God wanted to subdue. God wanted man to subdue all of the powers of darkness that were operating in the earth. If we look back into Genesis chapter 1 from verse 1, it says, In the beginning God created the heaven and the earth. And the earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep. Now, between verse 1 and verse 2, it is understood among many students of the Word of God that there are thousands of years that separate verse 1 and verse 2. And the earth was without form and void. Well, how could God create something that is without form and something that is without void? It, it has a meaning to it. It means that the earth had been created and it was teeming with life. But that first earth that God had created 
was judged by God and God destroyed it. And why did God destroy it? Because the inhabitants of the earth at that time were wicked. And so God decided that he was going to recreate the earth. Okay. And the earth was without form and void and darkness was upon the face of the deep. And the spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. And God said, let there be light. And there was light. And we know the story of how he continued to create everything. But look at what he says. Look at the words that he chooses to use. In verse 28, and God blessed them and God said unto them, be fruitful, multiply and replenish the earth. To replenish means to populate again. Meaning that before, in verse 1, before, before the earth was destroyed, the earth had a population. And that there were beings here at that time. Now, if there were beings here at that time and they had been destroyed to the extent that the earth was without form and void and darkness was upon the face of the deep, it means that God had judged that the inhabitants of the earth to the extent that he destroyed, he annihilated the earth. And the only thing that was left was darkness upon the face of the deep. And God decided that he was going to recreate everything again. But this time he was going to create man in God's image and in God's likeness. So what he was really saying was like, this time let's create mankind in our image. Who is our? God the Father, God the Logos, and God the Holy Spirit. In that blessed koinonia, that blessed relationship that intimate relationship whereby the three of them are one he said let us god is so great that he speaks of himself in plural and he says let us create man in our image so that man had can also be just as god is only slightly below elohim Adam, it's, it's, it's almost difficult to imagine how powerful a human being is and how far we have fallen from where God is because of this thing called sin. And if somebody realizes, if somebody really finds out what this thing is, what this thing means, what Jesus has given to us, there's nothing that can be impossible to us. But I'm, I'm digressing. Man was created just below God and able to carry the Spirit of God. And God said, let man, let us create man in our image. Well, there's God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. So if God has created man in the image and in the likeness of God, then man was to operate just as God operates. And man was to move as God moves. And man was to rule as God rules. And I believe that the prince of the power of this world, Satan, had seen the amount of glory and the honor and the power that God had given to man and was very jealous. Who is man that God should give him such glory and honor when we, the cherubim and the seraphim, have been there long before man? Who is man that God should give him such glory and such honor and such a position and a realm to rule? And I believe that jealousy is what sparked Satan's campaign against Adam and Eve. The result was the fall. The result is everything you see happening in the world today, a mixture of good and evil. Well, Erica said that after she was initiated to empower herself, she would cause accidents. She would astral project out of her body. See, these are some of the things that Adam could do without having to, you know, without having to be covenanted to the kingdom of darkness. Adam had authority, had dominion over the fish of the sea, over the fowl of the air, and over every living thing that moves upon the earth. Which tells me that Adam had powers that we have not yet understood. He had the kind of authority that we have not yet even discussed. Because without having tools, without having an airplane, how can you have dominion over the, the fowl of the air? That means that Adam could fly. That means that Adam could move through the waters at a speed that was faster than the beings of the of, uh, that are in the 
oceans. Adam can move f faster than them. And, that, and, and yet Adam could be in one place and yet communicate with the beasts of the field. He could be in one place and yet could be communicating with the fowl of the air, with the fish of the sea, and having dominion over them without using any kind of technology, which told me that this man was an incredible man. He was a God man. So we lost so much when Adam fell. So, if this authority was given to Satan, and then as a result of Erica being in covenant with the kingdom of darkness, now Satan, because Satan now puts his spirit in you, when you covenant with the kingdom of darkness, Satan doesn't trust you to do his work on your own. So he has to put a spirit in you so that you can do exploits in his kingdom. That's why the Gadarin had thousands of demons in him. So that he could do exploits in his kingdom. And, and Erica was talking about how she was causing accidents. She would go to the hospital. And as she's walking past, people are dying, 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 dying in the hospital. What does that mean? What is she suggesting? What is she telling us? What are the principles and the ordinances, the protocols that we can understand? And man is a very powerful vessel that he can carry spirits and that these spirits can find expression through the gateway of a human being. And that this human being can be used either for the kingdom of God or for the kingdom of darkness. Now, if man should choose that the Holy Spirit begin to find expression through his life, then the same man can be walking through a hospital and people are being brought back to life. Even walking through a morgue and somebody can be brought back to life. Somebody who's been dead two, three days is coming back to life, shocking the people who are in the morgue. And I mean, these are things that are very possible. These are things that can happen. It's just that the church has been playing religion. <laughs> well, once Satan has enters into a covenant with a human being, that person has violated the commandment of Exodus chapter 20, verse 3, 4, and 5. And when that happens, that means that their children and their children's children are cursed. That means that there will be altars and covenants speaking against that person's life for generation after generation after generation. And these are the things that many human beings are, are dealing with right now. And before we finish, we will go into a prayer whereby we will deal with the altars and the covenants that our ancestors entered into. Because it's very important to know that this scripture is alive and well even today. The word of God does not change. Jesus did not say, I've come to remove the law. He said, think not that I've come to destroy the law. I have not come to destroy it, but to fulfill it. So if the iniquity of the fathers can be visited upon the children and upon the third and fourth generation of, of those who violate the commandment of God, where God said, you shall not bow down to any other God before me. You shall not serve them. For I, the Lord thy God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children unto the third and fourth generation of them that hate me. So it has a powerful implication. Most of the people who are under the sound of my voice, you are suffering from curses, generational curses, and ancestral curses that came upon your life from ancestors whom you do not even know, but they violated this scripture. And because they violated it, there are altars speaking against you, there are covenants that are speaking against you that have a legal right to speak against your life because of the sins of your ancestors and the sentence of that sin that visits the iniquity of the fathers upon the children unto the third and fourth generation. That means four generations before you, there might have been one ancestor of yours who went to see a witch and that's it, that's enough. So because of that, it is good sense for any Christian to look into their history and to look at their lives and say, no, I should be further. I should be doing more in the kingdom of God. I should be doing exploits in the kingdom of God. Then you begin to find out what are the tendencies in my life? What tends to happen? You know, you look at somebody's life 
a mother, there's a, there's a grandmother died from cancer, the mother also dying from cancer, and the child is, is headed the same way. You see a generational curse. Anytime you go to the hospital, the, ho the doctors always ask a certain question. Do your, does your family have a, a history of this? Is there a history of this condition in your bloodline, in your family, your father, your father's father? Is there a history of this? What they are referring to really are generational curses. They might not understand it and they might not speak that way as physicians. But we understand these things because life is spiritual. Visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children unto the third and fourth generation means that there are children, there are offspring, there are descendants of fathers who have sinned. And these descendants are now suffering for the sins of their ancestors. And this thing is backed up by scripture. It's not just in Exodus chapter 20, verse 5 and 6, but look at, look, look at uh, the book of Lamentations. Let's look at the book of Lamentations, uh, which is just after Jeremiah. Yep, I'm right. Just, just after Jeremiah. Lamentations chapter 5 and verse 7. Our fathers have sinned and are not, and we have borne their iniquities. Look at that. Our fathers have sinned and they, ha they are not, meaning they have died. Our fathers have sinned and they have died and we have borne their iniquities. In other words, there is something more than just your DNA which you got from your ancestors. There's something more than just your good looks which you got from your ancestors. There's something more than just your characteristics that you got from your ancestors. You've also carried their curses. You've also carried their punishments. So, in all wisdom, what is the answer to this? It is found in God's word. He sent his word and healed us and delivered us from our destructions. This is why unless you live by this book, <laughs> there's no way you can make it in life. It, without this book, you cannot make it. Unless you understand this book, you will be a victim in life. Unless you understand what this book is saying, you'll always be a victim. You'll wander through life wondering, why is life so hard? Leviticus chapter 26 and verse 40. There's a way that you can deal with these ancestral curses and generational curses that are cursing your life, that are following you around. I'm talking to people who have been saved. You've been saved for 20,000 years. You've been saved 50,000 years, whoever, however long you've been saved. But there are still things that follow you around. There's still sounds that show up in your house. There's still demons that attack you at night. You're still, you're still having sex in dreams. You're still being attacked in dreams. Look, before we even read this scripture, Proverbs chapter 26, this scripture will help you to, to understand what's going on here. Proverbs chapter 26, verse 2. As the bird by wandering, as the swallow by flying, so the curse causeless shall not come. The curse cannot come without a cause. So if there's any curse that is visiting the third and fourth generation, it did not come without a cause. It, ca it came by cause. It had a legal right to come. So you must take care of that curse. You must handle that business. And just being saved is not enough to handle that business. The curse causeless shall not come. Now, by being born again and by believing in the Lord Jesus Christ, you have received salvation. Okay. The eternal one has come to live inside of you. He is your salvation. He personally living inside of you represents your salvation. He is your salvation. Psalms chapter 27 says, the Lord is my light and my salvation. So the Lord himself is your salvation. It's not that you have obtained salvation. You have obtained the Lord who himself is salvation. Okay. All right. So now that is enough to get you into heaven. But while you are here on this earth, this earth functions by laws and ordinances and protocols which have been already arranged before the foundation of the earth. Even before this earth was created, there was another earth which God judged and destroyed. That earth also functioned by laws and ordinances and protocols which they violated, which warranted the judgment that came upon them and God destroyed the whole earth at that time because of their violations of his laws. Now, being born again guarantees your entrance into heaven, guarantees 
your eternal life, which is a new body, which does not grow old, a new body, which does not get sick, a new body that is the life that is eternal. That's eternal life. But while you're here, you are subject to laws, protocols, and ordinances, which have already been set in place. Now, those protocols, those laws are written in the Old Testament. That's why we've been given the Old Testament and the New Testament. So there's no way you can start telling us, oh, we are under grace now, so we don't need to pay attention to the laws. That is foolishness. And if you just look at your life, you'll see that this grace, how come this grace has not delivered you from laws? Grace is not there to deliver you from laws. Grace is there to help you to keep the laws. All right. So Revelation chapter 14, verse 12 says, here is the patience of the saints. Here are they that keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. So look, those are two things right there. Revelation chapter 14, verse 12. Here are they that do two things. One, keep the commandments of God. Two, the faith of Jesus. So you need those two. If your life is going to be effective while you are here on the earth, you will need to keep the commandments. If you're going to enter into heaven, you will need to have the faith of Jesus. So you're going to need those two things. So don't ever think that once you're born again, that's it. Now, you know, you're on easy street. My friend, that's when the battle begins. That's when God begins to teach you and to inform you concerning his laws and his commandments. Jesus said, if you love me, keep my commandments, okay? So, Leviticus chapter 26 verse 40 gives us a way out on how to deal with these curses that we entered into. Erica's grandmother initiated her into witchcraft. But even if she had never initiated her, Erica would have still suffered greatly. Why? Because if your grandmother was a witch or if your grandmother only visited a witch in her ignorance, she visited a sorcerer so that she can get some kind of assistance. You, vill you village in Kenya, we call them Waganga. You visited a witch in, in South Africa, you call them the Sangoma. Okay, in, 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 in the Caribbean, in the islands, they call him the Obiaman. You, your grandmother, your mother, your parents, your ancestral line, they visited the Obiaman. And, if, and if, as soon as you visit that person, you fall under the jurisdiction of Exodus chapter 20. You visited a witch, you visited a sorcerer, you bowed down yourself to another god to serve them. Immediately curses follow your bloodline to the third and fourth generation. Don't know how much destruction you've caused. By just getting, by seeking one favor from any other spirit other than the spirit of the living God, you have brought iniquity, you've brought curses upon your family to three and four generations. People are walking around with curses. They are overqualified for certain positions but can never get a job. Why? Curses are upon your life like a dark cloud following you around. And because life is spiritual and this spiritual life functions by laws, principles and ordinances, you must learn these ordinances so that you may deliver yourself. My Bible says, by knowledge shall the just be delivered. Let me show you that verse so that you know I'm not making up my own things. Proverbs chapter 11, chapter 11, verse 9. A hypocrite with his mouth destroys his neighbor, but through knowledge shall the just be delivered. So you'll be, my friend, if you don't have knowledge, you'll be destroyed. In fact, Hosea chapter 4 verse 6 confirms this. My people are destroyed from lack of knowledge. Knowledge of what? The knowledge of God's word. The knowledge of how the game is played. The knowledge of how the laws and the ordinances and the principles of life rule and reign over the lives of men. And many times men violate these laws or are walking under violations, walking under curses, and they don't know. Yet they're saved. They're born again. They're, they're in church. They're giving everything. But the way to come out from those curses is not by giving. The way to come out from curses is not by sowing seed. And that's why we felt so bad when we see people telling you to sow seed to this prophet, sow seed to that one, give over here, give over there, to, sell, or to wrap your money in, his, in, in, a, in a faith seed, seed faith. That seed faith doctrine is a false doctrine. It's a false doctrine. You've been doing it. it has, not, has it yielded results? Just look at your own life. It's not re yielding any results. Why? Because it's a false doctrine. You cannot bribe God. There are laws and ordinances. You obey the laws. You do what he told you to do. And you come out from those curses. But you cannot sow seeds to come out from curses. You cannot sow a financial seed to come out from curses. Those are lies. 
and any minister of the gospel who tells you those things, tell them, ask them to show you where in the Bible. And I don't want, I don't want to hear, I don't want to hear funny, oh, this is my revelation. G garbage. Chapter and verse, please. Chapter and verse. Show me the chapter, show me the verse where it says, I can give a financial seed to a man of God and the result will be deliverance from curses. Show me that verse. If you can't show me, don't bring us nonsense here. Because people's lives are at stake. People's souls are at stake. And false prophets are all over the place. And we need to do a segment just on how to spot a false prophet. Because Jesus said, the word of God says, test every spirit. And why do we test every spirit? Because false prophets are gone out into the earth. So how, how is it that the church can be having service after service, but there's no service to train believers train Christians on how to spot a false prophet, how to spot a merchandiser, somebody who has just come to sell merchandise, selling water, selling garbage, telling you to bring, you, bring, a, bring all of your uh, you know, seeds into the house, seed faith, garbage. These are false doctors. These are, these are people who are encouraging you to violate the scriptures. He that gives to the rich shall be poor. The Bible is very clear. If you give to somebody who is rich, you will come to want. If you don't give to the rich, you give to the poor. You see, these are, these are principles and ordinances that you are violating. And because you know not the laws, you're being violated. So, it is a must that we know God's laws. It's a must that we know God's word. Because God's word has the laws that are written in it. You just follow his laws the way they are written. And then you find that your life begins to flourish. Success functions by laws, and laws make life predictable. You can see the way a man is going, if he's going to be successful, simply by looking at the laws he's either obeying or disobeying. If he's keeping the laws of God, that guy will flourish. It's only a matter of time. He will rise, he will flourish, there's no stopping him. But if a man continues to violate the laws of God, whether he knows about those laws or not, he will fall. Okay, so David said, Thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against God. You see how, how, how far people go to learn God's word so that they can understand the scriptures and not violate laws. You see, because you can't see laws, they're, but they're there. And every time you violate those laws, they strike you. So people are going around getting struck by laws all the time because they're always violating them and they don't know why their life is so difficult. So it is crucial that you understand how to, how, to, how to keep the laws of God. Keep the commandments and the faith of Jesus. That's Revelation 14 verse 12. Keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. You must keep both. Now, Leviticus chapter 26 and verse 40. It shows us how to come out from the curses of our ancestors, our you know, fathers, the curses of the fathers that have come upon our lives. It shows us, verse 40, If they shall confess their iniquity and the iniquity of their fathers with their trespass, which they also trespassed against me, and that also they have walked contrary unto me, and that I also have walked contrary unto them, and have brought them into the land of their enemies. If then their uncircumcised hearts be humbled, and they then accept of the punishment of their iniquity, then will I remember my covenant with Jacob, and also my covenant with Isaac, and also my covenant with Abraham will I remember, and I will remember the land. So you see, the only way to bring that or have access to that covenant that you that God entered into with Abraham because that Abrahamic covenant is what brings a blessing upon your life I told you life revolves around altars and covenants and unless there is an altar and a covenant speaking for your life you cannot rise and if an altar and a covenant is speaking against your life you can never rise because those things will speak against you and that technology is spiritual. You cannot overcome it. It is precise. If it says you are to die at the age of 26 and three months, you will die at 26 and three months. Why? Is it, is, it is that precise. So, if they will confess their iniquity and the iniquity of their fathers, 
with their trespass which they trespassed against me, and that also they have walked contrary unto me, and that I also have walked contrary unto them, and have brought them into the land of their enemies. If then their uncircumcised hearts be humbled, and they then accept of the punishment of their iniquity, then will I remember my covenant with Jacob and also my covenant with Isaac and also my covenant with Abraham will I remember and I will remember the land. Now, you remember the covenant that God entered into with Abraham is a very clear and straightforward covenant. Let's turn quickly to Genesis chapter 12. Now the Lord had said from the, verse, from the first verse, Now the Lord had said unto Abram, Get thee out of thy country, and from thy kindred, and from thy father's house, unto a land that I will show you, and I will make of thee a great nation. Look at the promises that God has given Abraham. These are the very promises that we seek to have access to. We want these promises to show up in our lives. We need these promises to show up in our lives. And we gain access to these promises promises by gaining access to the covenant that God made with Abraham thousands of years ago, yet it is at work today, and this technology cannot be stopped. And I will make of thee, verse 2, I will make of thee a great nation, and I will bless thee, and make your name great, and you shall be a blessing. And look at the promise here, and I will bless them that bless thee, and I will curse them that curse thee, and in thee shall all families of the earth be blessed. So you see how people are supposed to gain access to the blessings that God has for them? The only way you can access those blessings, the only way is by paying close attention to the laws that God has written. So if God is saying, repent for the sins of your fathers, do so because those sins have curses that are attached to them and those curses are having full effect on your life today. And this is why you look all over the world. Anywhere you see poverty and lack and hardship and sickness and disease and all manner of chaos, anything other than righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Ghost, wherever you see it, you know the curse of witchcraft, the curse of idolatry is abiding in that place. So if you see any of those things in your life, you can rest assured there are curses that you must deal with. There are generational curses that you must deal with. Also, because there are witches today who may see you doing well and they hate your progress. Jesus said, a man's enemies shall be them of his own household. So there are even family members who will see that you're rising and they go to a witch to bring you down. Okay, but those witches, those wizards, those warlocks cannot have access to your life unless there is already a curse on your life, unless there is already an open door. So yours is to find, where is this open door? Have I dealt with the generational curses? Have I dealt with the ancestral curses? Have I dealt with the altars and the covenants that are speaking in our bloodline? Because Proverbs chapter 26 has already told us, the curse causeless shall not come. A curse cannot just come for no reason. So. We are just beginning to touch on this thing, but we are going to continue to expound on it further because these things are following people's lives around. Curses preventing you from getting visas. Curses preventing your business from flourishing. Curses preventing you from marrying. Curses that bring disease and sicknesses. All of the curses are written in Deuteronomy chapter 28 from verse 14 all the way down to verse 68. In fact, let's just, let's just look there very briefly we see that Deuteronomy chapter 28 is at work on people's lives right now. The law, the, there is no escaping the law of God. Every human being functions by the laws of God, either to their benefit or to their demise. But either way, this thing is at work in your life. Deuteronomy chapter 28 has a list of curses eh? from verse 15 all the way to verse 68. But one of interest is this one of verse 27. The Lord will smite you with the botch of Egypt and with the emeralds and with the scab and with the itch whereof you cannot be healed. Whereof you cannot be healed. Do you know what emeralds are? Emeralds are tumors. Emeralds, it's this thing you call cancer. It says 
it cannot be healed. That's why people are dying of these things all the time. And men will go in there and pray for them. But if you've not dealt with generational curses and ancestral curses, how can you be healed? There are laws that are speaking. So God is calling his people back to an understanding of the laws, ordinances, and protocols of his word. If you live by them, you flourish. If you ignore them, it is to your detriment. And the quality of your life as a Christian is highly dependent upon your understanding of these laws, ordinances, and protocols, and your obedience to them. And as you obey them, you'll begin to rise. You'll see your life is changing. You'll see that things now are going your way. Remember, God promised Abraham, I will bless them that bless you. I'll curse them that curse you. So if you are under the Abrahamic blessing, and yet there are still people who are cursing your life. There are still witches who are cursing you. How is that possible when God said, I will bless them that bless you and I will curse them that curse you? It means that the curse causeless, because the curse causeless shall not come. It means that there is an open door for that witch to curse your life. And if the witch cannot find you in sin, then the witch will look through your ancestral line to see if there's any uncovered curse, any uncovered sin, any unrepentant sin. And if she finds it, ah, it's easy to hit you. So as we grow in the knowledge of the word of God and in the principles of, and the laws and the ordinances, we become sharp, we become wise. Jesus said, because of your laws, I am wiser than my teachers. This school of thought is not taught, it's not common in the body. So. Our desire is to make these things known. Now, when Erica would send curses, would astral project and cause a vehicle to overturn, she would first of all analyze, is there any upon whom the curse can abide? Is there any who's living in unrepentant sin? Is there any whom I can access? I'm telling you, if every one of them was covered under the blood in that vehicle, if every last one of them was saved and they had dealt with generational curses, she could not have made that car overturn because you cannot touch anyone upon whom there is no curse. In Numbers chapter 23, eh, there was a king by the name of Balak. Balak went to a certain sorcerer who was supposed to be a prophet. You know, oftentimes these people who are gifted in the area of, of sorcery and witchcraft, your local Mganga, your local Mze, your, lo your local Jaja, your local Sangoma, your local Obiaman was supposed to be a prophet, but he decided to corrupt his calling. And because the gift and calling of God is without repentance, he can still use that gift, whether it is going to be to the glory of God or to betray God. But either way, the gift will remain. So this Balaam was a prophet who decided to corrupt his gift. And really he was... He became the veteran or he became the, the, the prophet who paved the way for all of the false prophets. He became the father of false prophets. You see, we have Abraham, who's the father of faith. Balaam was the father of false prophets. Now look at Numbers chapter 23. Balak was a king. And Balak had heard about the children of Israel, how, how, how God had delivered the children of Israel out of the hand of Pharaoh and out of Egypt and had destroyed an entire empire of Egypt. And all of these nations were afraid of Egypt because Egypt was the superpower of the day. Egypt was like America boss, okay? Egypt was the America of that day. And Moses, by the power of God, had destroyed Egypt, including Egypt's president, Pharaoh, was destroyed, they all died, okay? So now all of the surrounding nations had heard of this story and had heard of the children of Israel. And now Balak was trying to find a way to destroy the children of Israel. But Balak had enough sense. He knew you cannot destroy a people unless you can send a curse in to destroy the people first. So Balak went to Balaam to hire Balaam so that Balaam can send curses upon the people. But when Balak had done exactly what Balaam told him to do, you know, build me seven altars and bring me seven oxen and seven rams and I shall sacrifice. Now, by the time oxen and rams are being sacrificed on an altar, you know that this guy was not calling small spirits. He was not calling these little tiny demons. He was not calling fairies. He was calling principalities and powers and rulers of the darkness of this world to come and send curses. I told you 
Life revolves around altars and covenants. He could not curse the children of Israel until there were altars placed and covenants placed upon those altars and sacrifices not without blood. So Numbers chapter 23 verse 8. Balaam gives his answer to Balak. Balak is saying, curse these children of Israel for me. Look what Balaam says in Numbers chapter 23 and verse 8. How shall I curse whom God has not cursed? Or how shall I defy whom the Lord has not defied? You see what Balaam is asking? In other words, a curse cannot come upon your life unless that curse was already upon your life because of your own disobedience or because of the disobedience of your ancestors. In some way, shape, form, some way they violated the law of God, that law of idolatry, that law of witchcraft, consulting witches. That thing brings a terrible curse upon your life. You'll find that everything is limited because of that thing. Everything you try to do, whether it's getting married, whether it's just being healthy, whether it's being acceptable. Anytime you try to apply for a job, you're overqualified, but they reject you. And somebody who's underqualified gets the job. Why? There are curses that abide on people's lives. But Balaam is asking Balak, how shall I curse whom God has not cursed? Or how shall I defy whom the Lord has not defied? If you don't get anything from this, get that verse right there. Numbers chapter 23, verse 8. Because no one can curse you unless God has allowed it. In other words, and the only way that God has allowed it is because you have violated a law. And really, you're the one who's opened the door. By violating the laws of God, you open the door. So God wants people to know his laws, his ordinances, and his protocols. So that people can operate within the boundaries of his laws. Because if you function within those boundaries, your life will flourish. But... If you are ignorant of those boundaries, the Bible says, he that breaks a hedge, a serpent shall bite him. What is that hedge? Let me find that, that scripture for you. Ecclesiastes is right after Proverbs. Because those are still the writings of Solomon. Ecclesiastes chapter 10 and verse 8. There it is. He that digs a pit shall fall into it and whoso breaks an hedge a serpent shall bite him what is he saying he that breaks a hedge a serpent will bite him every time you violate a commandment of god you are breaking a hedge and every time you break a hedge what does the bible say a serpent will bite you what is that serpent is the curse to empower you to fail okay so honor the hedge of the lord keep the commandments keep his commandments and live all right so <sighs> we will get further and further into this we will be dealing with these things ancestral curses are very real generational curses are very real they abide even on people who are born again you've been born again 20 30 40 years but you still are yet to see the glory of god you are still your ministry is still yet to flourish and you're wondering why is because these things are real and many of these local churches are not teaching these things. They are telling you to sow a seed. They are telling you to bring your tithes in. All those, that's all, those are all false doctrines because you've been doing it all this time. What are the results? How has that worked out for you? It hasn't worked. So how about we now choose to obey the laws and the commandments of the Word of God so that we can begin to flourish in life. And as you keep the commandments, you will flourish. He says, the path of the righteous man shines brighter and brighter unto the perfect day. So your life should be an ever-increasing, ever-improving journey as you continue. Amen? So, as I said, I will pray for you and pray with you concerning generational curses. So that you can come out from some of these curses. Because witchcraft, sorcery, and the results of the sins of your ancestors cannot be taken, up, taken care of unless it is through the protocol of repentance. So let us pray and I'll lead you into a prayer of repentance. Wonderful, glorious King, we thank you for this wonderful day. We thank you for your word, for your laws, for your ordinances, for the pro protocols of your word, for the very many instances where we see the ordinances and the protocols of your word, either working for men or against men. We see how the children of Israel had obeyed your laws and ordinances in the book of Numbers. And because they had obeyed 
Balaam, who sold himself out to the enemy, was unable to curse the children of Israel, saying, how can I curse whom God has not cursed? Or how can I defy whom the Lord has not defied? So our aim, therefore, is to be blessed of the Lord indeed, is to walk in such a manner that the Lord does not defy us, to walk in such a manner that we please the Lord in obeying his commandments. Therefore, Lord, because many under the sound of my voice have violated these laws, these ordinances, these protocols, and because their parents have done the same, their ancestors are guilty of the same, I want to lead them in this prayer. Therefore, you who are under the sound of my voice, you know you are dealing with generational things. You are going to be praying this prayer over time. It is not an instant thing. You will be praying it over time. Father, in the name of Jesus, I thank you for your word. It is very clear. It says, if I will confess the sins of my fathers and admit that, this, that the result of their sins is what I'm facing, and if I will repent for their sins, then you will hear from heaven and then you will remember your covenant with Abraham and Jacob and Isaac and you will then heal the land. Therefore, right now, Lord, we pray and we repent for the sins of our ancestors. We repent for their idolatry, for their necromancy, for their witchcraft, for their consulting witches, for their palm reading, for their divination. We repent for their necromancy and from worshiping other gods. We repent and we confess their sins right now. And we pray that you forgive us and that you wash and cleanse us from all unrighteousness and that the blood of Jesus wash and cleanse us from this unrighteousness. And right now, Heavenly Father, the covenants that they entered into, we pray that you break those covenants. And we pray, O oh, Heavenly Father, that those altars that are speaking words against our lives may be overturned. Overturn every altar and every covenant that my ancestors entered into either consciously or unconsciously. And every sin and every altar I entered into, any covenant I entered into, either consciously or unconsciously, overturn them, Lord. Overturn those curses, Lord. Break those altars, break those covenants. Arrest those monitoring spirits. Arrest the familiar spirits. Bind them in the name of Jesus and cast them into the pit of hell to be tormented before their time. And by the authority vested in me, by the shed blood of Jesus, I denounce and renounce all of the sins of my family tree. I denounce and renounce all of the sins of my ancestors. And I pray, Father, for a fresh start. And I pray that the curses that were just judgment that were passed upon my bloodline because of their sins may be taken out of the way and nailed to the cross of Calvary that I may go free for it is written Jesus has taken upon himself the curses of us all himself bore our sicknesses and carried our sorrows Therefore, I pray that you take away these curses. And as I begin to fast and pray this prayer continuously, may the bands of wickedness be broken. May the generational curses be broken. And may you now invoke and remember your covenant with Abraham and with Isaac and Jacob and cause those blessings to find expression in my life that I may fulfill my purpose and my destiny, and that my life may begin to flourish. These things, Father, I pray in Jesus' name. And now I pray for every soul that has prayed that prayer. Father, I pray 
that you lead them in the path of fasting and lead them in the path of recovery. For your word says, I will restore all the years that the canker worm, the palmer worm, the locust, <clears throat> and the caterpillar have devoured. I thank you, Father, that you are a restorer. Your word says, he restores my soul. I thank you for the souls that are being restored by this knowledge, by the knowledge of your word, by the knowledge of your law. I pray that you bless all those who have endured, who have stayed up to the end of this message. I pray, Heavenly Father, that you may bless them. Bless all those who are partnering with this ministry. We bless them. We cover them in the precious blood of Jesus. I declare there shall no evil befall them. Neither shall any plague come near their dwelling. A thousand shall fall at their side, ten thousand at their right hand, but it shall not come near them. We thank you, Father, that curses are leaving people's lives and being replaced by the blessing of the Lord, which makes rich and he adds no sorrow to it. We thank you, Lord, for a new era, a new army of those believers who pay close attention to the commandments of the Lord and keep the faith of Christ. We honor you, Father. We glorify you. We pray that this word may reach every soul for the recovery of that which was lost. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen. So if you prayed that prayer, I guarantee you, you will begin to see changes in your life. There are steps you must take. I recommend a three-day fast while you are praying this prayer of repentance to break generational curses, to break ancestral curses. You must fast and, 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 and live a holy life. So fast and pray three days minimum. Okay, if you are unable or perhaps you're elderly, you know, uh, do a six o'clock fast. You may break fast at 6 p.m. or do a tea fast or do a certain kind of a, a Daniel fast. You can read about the Daniel fast and find out what kind of fast that is. But I insist, Jesus told the disciples, this kind comes not out but by fasting and prayer. So there are certain, there are certain things that cannot leave your life unless you fast to break the bands of wickedness. Now, as you are fasting, you're refusing to eat. Let someone who is poor eat that food. Let someone who has nothing begin doing works of charity. I suggest you begin charity immediately. Do works of charity. Give to the poor. Give to the downtrodden. Feed the hungry. Shelter the homeless. Clothe the naked. Don't give to the rich. Give to the poor. Keep judgment before you. Choose wisely because you can choose what you want to do with your life. You can choose to give to those who have or you can choose to give to those who don't have. The decision between those two is a showcase of your ability to judge. So as you are doing these things, the bands of wickedness, the bands of generational curses, the chains and the shackles will begin to break from your life and you'll see the power of God flowing in your life. And I can't wait to hear your testimonies. We love you. God bless you. Bamboo, I'm out. Erica served Satan for 18 years. After her deliverance through the Lord Jesus Christ, she traveled throughout Uganda ministering and testifying of her experiences in churches, schools, and at any gathering of people where she could speak. One day after ministering in a Ugandan village called Midiana, they had an accident while riding on a small motorbike after a crusade. Erica's wounds were so deep that she died. Erica explains what she saw after she passed. She describes heaven, some of the different levels, and how she entered into that glorious place. She describes the angel of death, his operations, and the inner workings of the kingdom of darkness. Download this book and bring fires of revival back into your life. From lifeisspiritualministries.org God bless you.